Excellent. Thank you very much, Frank, for that introduction. And uh, thank you for the invitation to come to UNR to, to give this talk on some of our research on carbon sequestration. I've had a really enjoyable day uh, meeting with both faculty and students. Um, far more meetings with students than I often get to have when I visit a university. And so that's really been a treat for me. The work that I'll be uh, showing here today is very much a collaborative effort. Um, supported by the Consortium for Clean Coal Utilization, which is a group at Washington University, uh, industrial consortium, and then the National Energy Technology Laboratory of the Department of Energy. My team members who worked on this, you'll see work from Rachel, from Wei, and from Yanuk. I work with a chemistry professor, Sophia, a physics professor, Mark, and then uh, some of their students. Jill is an earth scientist. Phil is an earth scientist on this project. Uh, You'll see some work at the end uh, with Brian Ellis, who's a pro assistant professor at University of Michigan, and then some work with uh, Catherine Peters and her group at Princeton, and then a group at the NETL in Morgantown, West Virginia, really led by uh, Grant Brommel. So you're going to see things from a lot of different groups. I get the great opportunity to be the PI on the project to come and talk about some things that most of them we did in our lab, but some of them we did not. Um, but before I get into the research, I want to set up a little bit for you about where I am from. Uh, it's a confusing name of a university, Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, since this is a hydrology uh, seminar series, I figured this was the appropriate uh, map to show you. We have on average about 250,000 cubic feet per second of the Mississippi River flowing south past us right there, draining quite a few states right there and heading south. Um, I've never gotten to give a, a talk in the Great Basin, so it's a pleasure to be here. So, my department has a rather unique name. We're called Energy, Environmental, and Chemical Engineering. We're not civil and environmental. We're Energy, Environmental, and Chemical Engineering. And we work in four core areas. Uh, I sit in the water area, but we also have strength in aerosols, metabolic engineering, systems biology, and then some core areas of chemical engineering. Right now, we have 17 faculty, 100 PhD students, a uh, decent number of undergrads, and some master's students. Okay. So the engineered aquatic processes area, um, <clears throat> I'm really proud of my colleagues. Uh, Frank mentioned I have a career award. John Fortner got his uh, a year ago. Young Shin got hers, or I think four years ago. Um, and we're very strong in environmental chemistry if you look at the three of us and then Cynthia Lowe, who comes at things much more from the computational chemistry side of things. So we're very chemically focused. We look at both engineered and natural systems. We have four people all focused in there on environmental chemistry of uh, water systems. Types of things that we would look at collectively as a group on the water area would be water supply, energy water nexus, and environmental quality, looking at things. Uh, Frank will understand what that is. That's a, a synchrotron. That's the advanced photon source. Uh, I won't be showing any results from that today, but we do use molecular scale techniques like that. We've done some field research. That's the rifle site on the banks of the Colorado River, where we've done some uranium remediation work, and then some very fundamental computational chemistry work. My own group, I call it the Aquatic Chemistry Laboratory. And what links all of the project is that all of the projects involve reactions at solid water interfaces. With the exception of one project, which is the one I'll talk about today, they also involve toxic trace elements. Okay, today I won't talk about toxic trace elements, but most of our projects are focused on heavy metals and radionuclides. Um, the three general tools or techniques that we would use in our work, bench scale experiments, bench scale aquatic chemistry experiments. We are interested in solid water interfaces, so we also characterize the solids that we work with, spectroscopically, electron microscopy. You will see some of those results today, and then modeling. And so you can see kind of a sampling of some of our work. That's an electrocoagulation reactor that we're currently using to remove hexavalent chromium and selenate from drinking water and from industrial wastewaters. That is a magnesium silicate particle over here, and on the surface of it is growing a magnesium carbonate mineral. I think you will see that one again today. And then this is some surface complexation modeling work that we've done on uranium absorption onto manganese oxide. So looking at bench scale reactors, solid phase characterization, and modeling. And that's the general tool set that we bring to look at most of our projects. The current group, I don't know how the professors here organize their groups, but we organize ours by the periodic table. So when a new student comes into the, the group, we put the periodic table on a dartboard, hand them a dart, and say, pick your project. Amazingly, they've all landed their darts on things that tend to be important things to, to study. Chromium, uranium, uh, carbon, selenium. Uh, lead is something that we've worked on in the past, and we're also starting to get back into lead and lead corrosion control. So our current six projects, if you will, we've always had work in the drinking water area. So we have chromium removal by electrocoagulation, and then working on magnetic nanoparticles, which are really strong sorbents 
for removal of toxic trace metals. Biogeochemical processes in soil and groundwater. This is where uh, Professor Young and I have certainly overlapped the most. Um, trace metal impact on methanogenesis. And metals in urban community gardens. That was a fun project for us to have being in St. Louis, which has some history of lead mining. But the project I'll talk about today is in our area of environmental byproducts of energy, uh, of energy use, which involves selenium, but also geochemical aspects of carbon sequestration. So I'll start telling you a little bit now about that particular project. So to motivate this, I'll give you your review. I think for most of, not all of you, it'll be a little bit of a review on climate change. But then we'll start thinking about our strategies, both natural and engineered strategies, to mitigate carbon emissions to the atmosphere. So this is the famous Keeling curve uh, carried on, uh, updated for this month. That's April 2016, atmospheric CO2 levels at Mauna Loa. It goes up and down once a year because it's in the northern hemisphere and there's more land mass in the northern hemisphere. And so you have this respiration of the biosphere. But what's, of course, most important is that we've gone from 310 in 1958, about 280 for pre-industrial times, up to a current one, which is over 400 parts per million carbon dioxide. And this has serious implications for the global climate. It has serious implications for the global climate, because if we look at the global carbon cycle, this is a little bit of an older plot, but I rather like it. Uh, the red things are things that have changed since pre-industrial times. And so we can look and see carbon moving along, moving around between different boxes in the environment to the tune of gigatons of carbon per year. And anything in a box is the amount in that reservoir. So there it is in the atmosphere was 597 gigatons of carbon before pre-industrial times, we've increased 165. That exchange between the terrestrial biosphere and the atmosphere, that's what causes that annual cycle. Fortunately, some of the excess in the atmosphere has been picked up by excess growth, okay? There is net exchange between the atmospheres and the oceans, but of course, we have fossil fuel combustion. There is no exchange between fossil fuels in the atmosphere, or at least not on any type of human time scale. And so that's 6.4 gigatons of carbon per year. Right now, I think it's probably closer to nine gigatons of carbon per year, is unbalanced emissions of carbon accumulating in the atmosphere, leading to greenhouse gas increases in the atmosphere, leading to climate change. Now, there is one place where carbon gets out of the system, and it's right down there about 0.2 gigatons of carbon per year buried in sediments, okay? And that's also interesting, that's about 0.2 plus 0.2 gigatons of carbon from weathering. And that weathering is the interaction of atmospheric CO2 with the rocks and minerals at the Earth's surface. What I'm gonna be talking about in terms of the chemistry of my talk is very much short-circuiting this weathering path. What if instead of having the atmospheric CO2 interacting with the surface minerals, we send the CO2 directly to the most reactive minerals in the Earth's crust, allow those to react. Could we sequester more? Okay. Now, we have these increasing carbon dioxide emissions. What are we going to do about them, and what are the implications? I'll take a second to orient you to this plot. Maybe we'll start and work from right to left. So this is projected change in, a spheric, or in, in global surface temperature, global average surface temperature changes for different scenarios. Okay. 1 degree C, 2 degrees C, all the way up to possibility of 6 degrees C. And so those are how things might be changing. And then the nice thing here is you can actually see the uncertainty estimates on that. Okay. Out of the Paris agreements that we had in December in discussions, 1 and a half to 2 degrees C is what was set as a desirable limit on increase in the average surface temperature to avoid uh, dangerous as disturbances with the uh, global climate system. So we want to be right around there. Okay. Now we can map that blue curve over to here. And this would have to be a trajectory of carbon dioxide emissions in the future that would allow us to have warming of one and a half to two degrees C. And so the blue curve means, and this we increase a little bit, by the middle of this century we peak and then we go down. So we have to peak our emissions, and then we actually have to decrease them. If you look at more of a business as usual scenario, which would be the red, that's business as usual emissions for the next 1,000 years, and you project that onto what the implications would be for the climate system, you'd be looking at an average surface temperature increase of three degrees with some considerable uncertainty on that. So the general idea is if we want to limit our increases, we have to bend the curve of carbon dioxide emissions. 
So how are we going to do that? There's a paper, it's one of my favorite papers that I've ever read. It's a 2004 paper by Rob Socolow and Steve Pakala at Princeton that looked at this idea of stabilization wedges. Okay? And so that's business as usual. This is how they want to try to bend that curve down. Okay? They did, I think, two really smart things with this. They said in order to bend that down, you've got to do seven of these 15 things. And they chose 15 things that they said we could do with available technologies. Okay? So an important thing here was you had to do seven of those 15. Okay? You don't have to do all 15. You just have to pick your favorite seven. Three of those would involve carbon sequestration. Capture carbon dioxide at a baseload power plant. Capture CO2 at a hydrogen plant. Capture CO2 at a coal to sin fuels plant. If you could do that and then sequester the carbon dioxide, you've got three of your desired stabilization wedges. Okay? The other brilliant thing that they did was that that curve right there looks a lot like exponential growth, right? And you guys are scientists and engineers who understand exponential growth. They decided that policymakers couldn't do exponential growth, but they could understand basic triangles. So they reduced this, which you actually have to use calculus to understand the area in the green wedge, down to seven green triangles, which there's a possibility that our elected representatives would be able to understand the area of a triangle. Uh, and so the idea being you could get to seven of these wedges, simplify this down, and, and we'd be there. Okay? This was two academics sitting at Princeton thinking up this idea. Similar things have come out from the International Energy Agency's Greenhouse Gas Committee. This was something they presented uh, a year ago at a conference focused on carbon capture and sequestration, where they're saying, okay, from 2011 to 2050, this is a 50-year time horizon, how are we going to bend that emission profile down? If we want to peak and then end up down here, how are we going to do it? And a take home from this is there's no silver bullet. There's no single solution that we can use to solve this problem. We're going to have to use multiple approaches. And so they looked at this and they said, okay, you've got nuclear, you've got uh, end of use fuel switching, you've got carbon capture and storage, which is the purple right there. So that could make up a substantial part of how we could achieve this decrease in net CO2 emissions. Of course, you also have renewables, you have efficiency. So you've got a lot of things that are available to us. We shouldn't take any of them off of the table, and we should pursue all of them because we might need all of them. Okay. So that's the kind of motivation for this. Now we've captured the CO2. What are we going to do with it? Okay, so we've captured the CO2. We could do something called engineered mineral carbonation. I think that would be really cool. It would be really expensive, involve some large reactors. Our work's quite related to it. We could bury it in the oceans, put it in the bottom of the oceans. We could feed it to plants. Let's see, there we go, industrial uses. Let's grow some biofuels with this. Need very large areas for that. Or we could put it down deep underground for geologic storage. Okay. And I'm gonna be talking today about geologic storage. So we've captured the CO2. We have to find some place to put it. The most popular places to put this are going to be if we can go ahead and inject our CO2, so we have our injected CO2, into a deep saline aquifer, which we might have right there. Okay. We could do something called enhanced oil recovery, and this is where we're doing most of our carbon sequestration right now. We're going to inject CO2 right there with the blue, and that's going to help us push out of a formation some oil or gas in that formation. So we're going to help sweep that out. We leave some of the CO2 behind, so we sequestered some CO2. We produce some hydrocarbons. That could be advantageous. So we're going to look at a variety of these different formations. In order to get the density of CO2 that we want, we don't want to store a compressed gas because that's not very dense. Okay? Gas at atmospheric pressure and temperature, about 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter. You want to store a million metric tons of CO2. You need a lot of cubic meters. Okay? So you want to get that as dense as you can, and you're going to want to be up in a region where you have pressure and temperature where your carbon dioxide ends up being a supercritical fluid. So to get the pressures and temperatures that you want, you're going to go down at least 700 meters underground, in many cases 800 meters. Okay. And then once that carbon dioxide is down there, all kinds of things happen. Um, I argued with Young Shin about this figure a lot. I thought it was too busy. You can tell me if you think it's too busy as well. Uh, but I put it out there. That's uh, from a special issue of ESNT on environmental and geological aspects of carbon sequestration from 2013. And maybe the fact that it's busy can convey to us that we have all kinds of things going on. 
reactions with existing minerals. We have possible biological things going on. We have multiple scales that are at play here. We have to think about wells. Okay. So where are we going to do this? Well, to date, most uh, injection of carbon dioxide into deep aquifer or into deep geologic formations has been into deep saline aquifers, which tend to be sandstones. They have a lot of porosity. They have good permeability. They have very little reactive minerals, um, but they can be in some of the right places for us. And so the Sleipner site in the North Sea has been operational since 1995, injecting into a saline aquifer uh, that is underneath the seafloor of the North Sea. Uh, about 150 miles from where I live in Decatur, Illinois, there have been two projects there, each of which generated a has injected a million tons of carbon dioxide into the Mount Simon sandstone. And a million tons of CO2 is about the output of a large coal-fired power plant. Okay? So this is the scale of CO2 injection that we would need to do. And we've done it. Uh, they injected the CO2. They're monitoring where it is, whether it's leaking or not, how it's spreading out in that formation. And there's this figure that uh, a lot of people have seen and have, have referred to about what happens to that carbon dioxide. Well, they say for the first 10 years, it's all just this CO2 bubble trapped underneath some type of capping formation. Okay. Then you have residual CO2 trapping, which is CO2, tiny CO2 bubbles that get caught in the pore spaces. Then after 1,000 years, you have solubility trapping where the CO2 is dissolved into the water. And then eventually, if you can wait 10,000 years, you could convert the CO2 over to carbonate minerals. Okay. Um, I think this is helpful. And I think it's useful for saline aquifers that are sandstone aquifers. I don't think that it has much bearing at all on other formations with more reactive minerals. And so if we work with more reactive minerals, we could have mineral trapping in much shorter time scales. And that's one of the things that I'll tell you today. And we know this uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, Peter Kellerman has done a lot of work in the uh, ophiolite of Oman, which is a peridotite, which is very, very rich in magnesium and iron-bearing minerals. It's mostly olivine. And they looked at this, and they see these white veins going through this. So this is a natural analog. Those white veins are magnesium and iron carbonates that are within a magnesium and iron-bearing rock. So it's okay. These things can form. There's a volume expansion associated with turning the silicate rock into a carbonate rock. And they said, well, maybe that can actually fracture the rock and open up new surfaces. So this could be a self-accelerating uh, approach. Work done by Todd Schaaf and others at Pacific Northwest National Lab. They reacted things for 850 days, 100 degrees C, 100 bar CO2. That's about what we would be doing in the deep subsurface. And they see these beautiful minerals forming on the surface. And these are carbonate minerals. So they've shown in the laboratory that this can happen. Now, this has also been done at the field scale. Relatively small, relative to, let's say, that Decatur project with a million tons of CO2. but. In Wallula, Washington, which is not the same as Walla Walla, Washington, but in Wallula, Washington, uh, they injected 1,000 tons of CO2 into a basalt aquifer. So instead of into a sandstone, they've injected into a basalt aquifer, which has a lot of magnesium and iron-bearing minerals in it. They came back two years later, and they think they see carbonates in that having formed. Okay? This one, this is great. It made the um, New York Times science section on a Tuesday, and when the New York Times picks up your research topic as a lead article, that's always good news for you. This was done in the Carb Fix project in Iceland, where they inject CO2 dissolved into water. They came back a year later, and they pull back cores, and they see that 80% of the carbon dioxide that they injected has turned into calcite, which is a calcium carbonate. So we don't have to wait 10,000 years for our injected carbon dioxide to turn into a solid phase. If we inject it into a very reactive formation, we can wait one year, and 80% of it could be converted over. Okay. Now, I should say, so this uh, would require certain formations, basalts and these peridotites. They're not as abundant. They don't have the same porosity. So there is a trade-off here between porosity and permeability of the sandstones and very low reactivity versus these basalts. And if you find the right formations that can have decent porosity in them and decent permeability, you can have very good reactive minerals and very extensive trapping. And when you've converted your injected CO2 to a carbonate mineral, that's leak-proof storage. Because a carbonate mineral isn't going to leak. 
So now, uh, it is a Friday afternoon, I understand that, so we'll see a little bit of chemistry here, but I know that many of you are in an environmental geochemistry class, so here we go with it. I'm going to illustrate the chemistry for a simple system, and it's actually one we've studied experimentally. It's the first one we've studied experimentally. Let's start with a simple mineral, magnesium silicate. This is the mineral forced right. You inject carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a weak acid. It's going to drive the pH down. Carbon dioxide at 100 bar CO2. It's a pretty good weak acid. It can drop your pH down to 3. At low pH, most minerals dissolve faster. So we've lowered the pH, and now we're driving the dissolution of our magnesium silicate. It's releasing magnesium. It's consuming H+. If it consumes H+, that's going to bring the pH up. Our inorganic carbon, which was already high, more of that inorganic carbon is going to become carbonate. And so now we have carbonate and magnesium. We have the right ingredients to make a magnesium carbonate mineral. So we've gone from a magnesium silicate plus CO2 to forming a carbonate mineral. And it can happen relatively quickly. Um, we've studied this reaction in a lot of well-mixed batch systems, but of course the subsurface is not a well-mixed batch reactor. The subsurface is poorly mixed, so we started doing systems in a tube like this. We take a tube that's open at one end, and we're going to pack it with forced right to start with. We have CO2-rich solution out here, and we want to see what's going to happen with this. The carbon can diffuse into the tube. The magnesium wants to diffuse out. What will happen? Will we get magnesium carbonates to form somewhere in this tube? What will happen if they do form? All right. So to give you a little bit of an outline where we are in this, how close we are to your Friday happy hour, we're partway there now. Um, so I wanted to give this little overview of carbon sequestration for you. And now we're going to talk about dissolution precipitation in uh, diffusion limited zones, starting with these simple packed tubes. It's better than a batch reactor, but it's still not a rock. Then we'll move on to actually looking at rocks. And then we're going to look for the last bit. Uh, our final thing will be to look at this coupling of flow and the, the chemistry. So we've got those packed tubes, like the one I just kind of conceptually illustrated for you. We're going to put this into a 300 milliliter stirred pressure, pressure vessel. Okay? That's what the pressure vessel looks like right there. That's like the best can of Coke you ever had, or the most carbonated one. 300 milliliters, about the volume of a soda can. And we don't put just a few bar of CO2 on it. We put a 100 bar headspace of CO2 that equilibrates with the water. There's that open-ended tube. So it's open at the top. Carbon can come in. Magnesium can come out. And we look and see what happens. OK, so there we are zooming in on it. Carbon's coming in, magnesium coming out. This is fun, because now we have geochemical gradients. In order to precipitate magnesium carbonates, we have to have carbonate and we have to have magnesium. And they're coming at each other from different directions. And if we look at along the depth of that tube, how much carbonate do we form, we see a peak, which is exactly what we would expect when we have these opposing geochemical gradients. So this is the location where the conditions first become favorable for making magnesium carbonates. Okay? So, and then we also are looking at this at different reaction times. So it starts out low, but then it increases, increases, increases. The other thing I'll say about this, we were worried that if we formed a lot of magnesium carbonate right here, it would fill up all of the pore space, cement off the reactor, and then nothing else would happen. And we would lose our ability to react with the minerals down here. Well, we don't. Even at the bottom of the tube, with increasing reaction time, we are still accumulating carbon there. So the system is not, at least for this system, self-passivating. And uh, if we take, essentially, those curves there and we integrate them and look at reaction times, here's what we have. So our reaction time, we're getting carbon contents. 4% of the solids in the reactor are carbon. And then if you convert that over to carbonate, we could have about 10% of the mass within just a month or two months has been converted over from silicate minerals over to carbonate minerals. So we have very good uh, conversions. We do start to have the reaction slow down, and this could be some of that coupling with the transport slowing it down, but it doesn't stop it. What are the minerals? So we do Raman spectroscopy on this. This is nice because we uh, can actually shoot through the side of the glass tube to get the spectra. You got a bunch of peaks for forced right, and then this is our three-day sample. So this is very short reaction time. That guy right there, that peak and that peak, that is magnesite. We also form something called hydromagnesite, which forms as an intermediate phase. But even within three days, we can track that product. And 
it's forming right in that zone where we would expect it to form, that spatial localization of the carbonate minerals. Not at the very top because the pH is too low and things are diffusing out, and not at the very bottom because not enough carbon has made it there. Okay, so we get that spatial localization right there. All right. Another spectroscopic tool that we've used to look at this is NMR spectroscopy. And this has been a lot of fun. We've worked with my colleagues Sophia Hayes and Mark Conradi where they have a reactor that's about the same kind of thing, a packed bed of forest right, some water, some CO2 on it, but they can use uh, carbon-13 labeled CO2 and do NMR to track the speciation of the carbon within a pressurized system. So this is fun. We can track the speciation of the carbon without breaking temperature and pressure. The Raman stuff that I showed you, we had to open up the reactor, take things out, and analyze them. But with the NMR, it sits down there inside of an NMR magnet. They can heat it up to 100 degrees C. And here we're going to go increasing times. They can see the aqueous CO2. They can see the bicarbonate forming. And then they can see this broad NMR pattern out here corresponding to a carbonate solid. So we can track when the carbonate is forming, when the solid's forming, how much of it is forming uh, in a reactor that is held at pressure and temperature. All right. We also can do some modeling with this. This was done in collaboration with Catherine Peters and her research group. Um, in terms of modeling, it's actually not that uh, complex. For a Friday afternoon, maybe it's a bit much, but we're looking at accumulation, diffusion, and dissolution. There's only one reaction in here that we account for its kinetics, and that's the dissolution of the forced right. Okay, so we have accumulation, diffusion, one rate-limited reaction. Everything else we assume goes to equilibrium. Okay. And we can then predict within that tube what will be the profiles of magnesium. Okay, so here's the dissolved magnesium within the tube and with time. It stays low at the open end of the tube because it's got 300 milliliters of water out there that it can diffuse out to. Okay? It accumulates lower in the tube. The carbon starts out high out here, but then it diffuses in, so we can predict how the carbon concentration will change within the tube. We can do the equilibrium speciation and get the pH within the tube. It's about three at the open end of the tube, and it's about six in the middle of the tube. Okay? We can do a calculation of the saturation index for magnesite. Okay? So once that becomes greater than zero, we could have favorable conditions for magnesium carbonate precipitation. And so we calculate the saturation index for magnesite, and we would predict that it would first become saturated anywhere from about a half a centimeter to one and a half centimeters within the tube. Okay. That was exciting for us because that lined up exactly with what we were seeing experimentally. And I should emphasize, this model was not at all fit to our experimental data. We just looked in the literature, got a dissolution rate for forced right, took known diffusivities of solutes at 100 degrees C, plug them into the model, and it tells us you should get spatialized localization of magnesium carbonates about a centimeter into your tube. And it's exactly what we see. Okay. So to finish up on the packed bed stuff, what did we learn? The carbonate precipitation is spatially localized. Okay. Geochemical gradients lead to local reaction rates within those packed beds that give you very different products than you would get with volume average properties. Okay. That carbonate-rich zone did not, it slowed down the overall carbon reaction, but it didn't shut it down completely, and that was good news for us. So then the question is, okay, that was a powdered rock, okay? I started by saying, the subsurface is not a well-mixed re uh, reactor. Okay, that's fine. Now you can look at me and say, okay, well, the subsurface is not powdered rocks, it's actual rocks with fractures and heterogeneity, okay? So those, uh, how will these occur in fractured rocks? So let's move on to fractured rocks. And here the questions are, if we have these, we're injecting our CO2. Here we have these microfractures lining some type of macrofracture. The yellow there is to indicate carbonate minerals. We could have something bad happening, like the carbonates form here and they block the fracture. And you've got this beautiful unreacted surface area at the bottom that can't react. It could kind of be a neutral case like this. Or it could propagate new fractures because of this volume expansion. So you could have essentially self-passivating, neutral, or self-accelerating. We don't know the answer to that. Okay. So we convinced the Department of Energy to give us the money to study this. We put together a team of earth scientists, engineers, physical scientists to see what we could do. So we're going to work with fractured basalt. 
We're going to put fractures in them. We're going to do bench scale experiments with and without flow, and we're going to characterize the heck out of them using ex situ techniques like the Raman that I showed, SEM, XRD, and also some in situ characterization techniques like the NMR and like uh, X ray computed tomography. And I'll show you a few of those results of all those different types. Okay. So the first thing we did was we. Uh, we worked with an artificial rock, and this was really fun because uh, I didn't know you could make artificial rocks. This is the great thing about doing interdis interdisciplinary work. My colleague, Phil Schemer, says, sure. If you want a rock with a particular mineralogy, we'll just make it for you. Okay, can you make me a rock that is nothing but forsteroid? He says, sure, we can do that. So it's a single mineral rock, so it's a monolithic sample. That's what it looks like. And we can put that down there in our systems. We can fracture it, and you can actually see the fracture. That's a uh, X-ray computed tomography image, so we're actually looking at the porosity if, of that. So we put a fracture right down the middle of it. And then we can look and see magnesium carbonates, those particles growing right there, on the surface of the forest right. So we're able to see that these carbonate minerals do grow on a, real, on a fractured rock, an artificial fractured rock, but a fractured rock all the same. So then we've moved on to basalts, okay? uh, magnesium and iron-rich uh, materials. Uh, we have a bank of six 600 milliliter reactors. That's what they look like right there. Each reactor has in it a stack of five cores. That's what they'll look like right here. A centimeter in diameter, 1.6 centimeters long. In order to do this in a reproducible manner, we mill into them a fracture surface. So you can see that right there. That is a 100 microns deep, about the thickness of a sheet of good paper. And we uh, seal that up with that other side. So you've got this one centimeter wide, 1.6 inch long, 100 micron deep fracture. And we want to see what is going to happen in that fracture. Okay. We coat the other surfaces of it with epoxy, so the only way that carbon can get in is right at the top in that slot, and the only way that magnesium or iron or calcium or silicon can get out is by diffusing out of that fracture into the surrounding solution. Okay. So we've been setting these guys up. Um, we've worked with two natural basalts. We now have a third one that we're starting to work with. One is a Columbia River flood basalt. Another is a serpentinized basalt. Uh, Rachel Wells is a geologist who we recruited to come and work in our group, and she did all of the characterization of this on the microprobe, looking at these thin sections that she puts together. So you can see very fine grain here, larger grains over here in the serpentinized one, and you can see the overall uh, mineralogy. The things I'll point out, this guy, the Columbia River flood basalt, it has a lot of olivine, and it has some pyroxene, okay? Our serpentinized basalt has essentially no olivine. Most of it is serpentine. And so those of you who've had maybe an igneous geochemistry course would be familiar with the alteration of olivine. Hydrothermal alter alteration of olivine will produce serpentine, okay? And so we essentially have a kind of a pristine olivine-rich rock and then an altered one over here in the serpentinized one. So we might see some differences in how those react with the CO2. So we take one of those cores, we react it, in this case for six weeks, this is the flood basalt, and then we open it up, all right? That's the top surface of it right there. We're going to look right down along that fractured surface, and we can see right in there some siderite. Well, we can see something forming. It was actually just earlier this week that we finally convinced ourselves that it was siderite. We do Raman spectroscopy of this, come in with the laser micro Raman, we get a peak that tells us it's a carbonate, for sure. It could be calcite, it could be siderite. And then we go and we get on the SEM, and we do the EDS associated with the electron microscopy. You can see these particles of siderite, 100 micron thick particles of siderite forming within the fracture, okay? And you can see where an olivine had been kind of getting etched away, and we're forming siderite. This guy, I'm not sure how well you can see it. This is, this is kind of fun because Remember, again, all of the chemistry is happening in a 100 micron thick zone. This particle is about 100 microns thick. You've got these nice facets of the siderite. Look at that right there. It's kind of like it got stuck or it was stuck on something. That's the top of it. So this siderite grain actually bridged across the fracture. It bridged all the way across that 100 micrometer fracture in just six weeks. So when we run our 12-week experiment, our 40-week experiment, if this guy continued to grow, it might actually blow up the whole basalt core and fracture it further. And so we're looking forward to seeing what will happen with that. Okay. 
This is the serpentinized basalt. We also see carbonates, but we don't see quite as many of them. But again, we can use the Raman spectroscopy to come in there and see that we do have a carbonate forming right there. They tend to be, in this case, clustered on the pyroxenes. <clears throat> we can look at where those carbonates are forming along that fracture. So that's our fractured surface. Uh, we are going to do total carbon analysis, but we've done so far. This was very labor intensive. So I uh, commend all the PhD students and master's students who do labor intensive work. Wei Shang, my PhD student on this, went through and actually would do a transects across this every 100 microns and say, is there a carbonate here? Is there a carbonate here? And then she puts all that together and we can see that spatial localization. The same thing that we saw in that pack bed of forstrite we're seeing here. That's the open end of the fracture, the top of the core. This is as you move into that 100 micron deep uh, slot that is quite deep. We can see that spatial localization and it increases from six weeks to 12 weeks. So the carbonates are becoming more abundant. That's the flood basalt, the serpentinized basalt, which we thought might be less reactive because it doesn't have that nice pristine olivine. It now has serpentine in its place. We do see carbon. These are above our detection limits, um, but it's much less abundant in there. All right. So that's what I wanted to say about the fractured rocks. Okay. Now the last thing I'll do is uh, show a little bit of the work that uh, Brian Ellis has done at University of Michigan with flow. I thought that would be appropriate for a hydrology system. And so now we're going to take rocks, fractured rocks, same fractured rocks that we've been working with, and we're going to put them in his triaxial apparatus. So that's a core that sits right there. That's to show a fracture. He can apply an axial stress to that. He can apply a confining stress to that, pushing in on it from all sides. And then he's going to flow CO2 rich fluids through that fracture. Okay. This is a uh, X-ray CT section of a saw cut basalt core. And you see that hairline fracture? Hopefully you can see that. That's a, a fracture. That's not mills for us. We just cut it. We roughen it with sandpaper. And so you might have a fracture with an average aperture on the order of 20 or 30 micrometers. Okay. And he's going to try to push CO2 rich fluid through that. He's also done things with fractures that look like this. This is kind of fun when you have a milling machine and a rock mechanics colleague to, to play with. He actually puts in this winding serpentinized path. So Brian also is going to push CO2 rich fluid through one of our cores and it's going to have to move through that path. Okay. Uh, I'll show you his results from the uh, flood basalt from um, the Columbia River flood basalt. That guy right there is the core holder. So you're seeing, no, actually that's it right. There's the core holder. You've got this confining pressure. Inside of that is that one inch diameter core and he's going to be pushing this fluid through it. Okay. First thing I'll show you is here is uh, for this particular fracture, it's a millimeter wide and 100 microns deep. And they push their CO2 rich fluid through it and they see a lot of stuff coming out. Okay, so here we're going to be just looking at the concentrations in milligrams per liter of magnesium, calcium, and iron. Okay, so all three of these, if we give them enough time, can form carbonate minerals. You can form iron carbonates, magnesium carbonates, calcium carbonates. And we see that the one reacted with the brine, which was instead of an ultra pure water, but with the brine, has the highest concentrations of all of them. Okay, in many cases, the one at the higher temperature, which is ES2, which are the diamonds. It's higher for the iron. It's actually lower. We can talk about that. Um, but we see abundant, you know, six milligrams per liter of iron. That's a decent amount of iron dissolving off of a basalt fractured surface, four milligrams per liter of magnesium. And so from this, we can extrapolate out that it shouldn't take that much longer before we would actually reach conditions where we could precipitate out carbonate minerals. For these particular ones, the residence time isn't sufficient to get there, but we're doing some modeling to then extend that. And then the last one will be permeability on this. So we'll show you the permeability here in millidarcies. That's the 100 micro, uh, micron milled path. That's the sandpaper roughened one. And that 100 micron milled path, we're actually not seeing much changes at all in the permeability. The drops right there are when they had to refill their pump, which is pushing the fluid through this. Uh, the sandpaper roughened then this one I think is interesting. That was that hairline fracture that I started showing you. You start out with decent permeability and then it starts to decline. It doesn't go away to nothing, but it does decline. Uh, and this is because 
the roughness on the fracture, which was actually holding the fracture opening, the roughness on the fracture, those rough high spots are dissolving away, and this is all under a confining pressure of 300 bar, so as those things dissolve away, the fracture actually can get compressed and make the fracture there actually less permeable. And so there are cases where we would expect the fracture to become more permeable, but here's one where it's actually becoming less permeable as a result of the dissolution. So my last slide here. Um, so we see that carbonate mineralization in these basalts can happen on very, very short time scales, a year or less. That's good news for a PhD student. You can actually sequester a lot of carbon dioxide in the duration of your PhD thesis. Um, the precipitation is spatially localized, both in these packed beds and also in the real fractured rocks that we've worked with. Um, the packed bed experiment showed us we can form these carbonate minerals, but it is not self-passivating, at least not for the conditions that we've seen so far. And there are important implications of the precipitates forming either self-passivating or ideally creating new fractures and propagating this to allow further carbonation. And so hopefully within the next four or six months, we'll have answered more questions on that final point about that coupling and the feedback to the flow. And uh, with that, uh, this is actually about what the university looks like right now. That is uh, Brookings Hall, uh, administrative building of the 1904 World's Fair and now kind of our landmark building. And if you're ever at Washington University in St. Louis, uh, please stop by and say hello and we'll show you some basalts. With that, I'll uh, thank you for your time and take any questions that you have.